Tenkate. Tenkate. Glenn Tenkate. Glenn is a coder, hacker, speaker, trainer, and security researcher. Glenn has over 10 years' experience in the field of security. He's employed as a security engineer at Schuberg Villas in the Netherlands, and he's been speaking at multiple security conferences. His goals are to create an open source software development lifecycle with the tools and knowledge gathered over the years. Introducing Glenn, he's going to be talking about the OWASP security knowledge framework, making the web secure by design. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for this uh, awesome introduction. <laughs> So uh, welcome, good to see you all here. Uh, so uh, I really want to talk today about, uh, well, this goal we had, uh, making the web secure by design. And we're gonna talk about the security knowledge framework and uh, how we try to achieve this. Um, so Jim already uh, t gave a very good introduction. Uh, the project leaders uh, of this uh, project here at OWASP is uh, myself and my brother, Ricardo Tenkate. So this is really like a broader uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> push to, uh, to make the web secure by design. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to use and explain the security knowledge framework, but first I want to, uh, well, give a bit of the idea what we had and what we're trying to achieve here. So um, I want to start with this. Everybody knows him, right? From the Matrix, Neo, the guy who can, you know, do amazing stuff, save the reality of, uh, well, the Matrix and be the hero. So today I want to go through the matrix and use some references and how I see developers and how we need to empower them. Uh, because yeah, basically this is what we're up against, like automated pwnage, agents everywhere, you don't know, uh, you can see the lady in red and suddenly it can be an agent, right? So we have a, a big thing here that we need to tackle. And um, it's also, we need to do this together. We need to share this information that we get over the years as security professionals, and we need to share knowledge to have a chance uh, against those type of guys. Um, because, uh, so the security knowledge framework really uh, fits this uh, uh, yeah, position and helps you to defeat against those type of guys. Um, so why did we, uh, in, in the first place, even start with the security knowledge framework? Well, uh, I'm doing more than 10 years in the application security uh, field, and <laughs> over the 10 years it gets more complex, more vulnerabilities, and it's even harder to maintain or get even a grip on it. Um, so, as you can see here, we, I had a lot of deja vu moments that I had like, oh my God, again? So I keep replaying myself, replaying myself, and I, I thought like, we need to do this better. We need to uh, help people, empower them. <coughs> because this is really the current situation of our developers. So as I talk about developers, I see how awesome they are. I mean, come on, they create all the functionality, they create the dreams of the business, right? Yeah, I want this functionality to integrate with this, this. So developers have a huge task to, to well, uh, do, and, and correctly, but too bad in the current situation it's like this. They have those awesome skills and, and potential, but yeah, they are dodging bullets, but they still got hit. So we need to alter this, we need to change this, we need to make from developers the real full-fledged Neo that won't have to dodge bullets. He can just stop them, right? So with that in mind, by uh, empowering people, we wanted to give options. We wanted really to help developers. Not only companies, but the whole idea when we started the security knowledge framework was to even empower all the developers, you know, the single guy uh, developers, like building awesome applications uh, at the addict or like businesses. So that's why we wanted to have some options. Um, luckily, there are ways to learn. I mean, OWASP is a great source of resources that can help you and really level up your application security knowledge and, and uh, also with all the tooling out there. Um, but most important, <coughs> it is now, first, you have to have a choice, right? So everybody remembers this, this part of the matrix where you had the choice or embracing the ugly truth, taking the red pill and see how deep that rabbit hole goes, or take the blue pill and be ignorant of all the issues out there, the type of vulnerabilities that you need to address when you're a developer. Um, so for that, uh, basically, we wanted to create the security knowledge framework. And 
what is it? It is a, a guide to secure programming. So it will help you, your development team and developers to address functionality in a safe manner. Um, also, it's about creating security awareness. So we have different phases in the project a developer can use. For example, the pre-development phase. Uh, you would use it as a developer before you start writing code. Uh, and basically, you can select in the framework the different type of functionality or technologies you want to uh, use or going to build in your next sprint. With this, uh, when you select the different type of technologies or functionality, the security knowledge framework will then correlate one of those functionality to one of the ASVS security controls, or better say, to a knowledge base item that says, hey, I see that you selected like, hey, user input or gonna do something with sessions. Think about all these attack factors that are out there and what the attacker can achieve with this uh, yeah, missing security control. Then we have a description on how a developer should approach this type of functionality and what are the edge cases when creating this type of functionality. So the idea is that you get the awareness up front uh, before you, you write code. Um, and of course, uh, clear and transparency is also important. So there is uh, everything that you will show, uh, that I will show on the uh, demo uh, in a couple of minutes. It's all on the GitHub, it has all the well, you know, GitHub, of course, it has all the, uh, the comments, all the backlog history, so you can see what's altered, what's changed. So everything uh, from the security knowledge framework is open and uh, yeah, free to use in your organization or for yourself. Um, another big thing, what is really important, is that we also use another project from OWASP, a really great one, uh, the ASVS, so the Application Security Verification Standard. Um, in my opinion, it is one of the most extensive, best lists uh, I've seen out there today. So I'm really happy with it. Respect for the, all the uh, project leaders who, uh, who, who does this project. So basically, you have a couple of levels in here in the ASVS uh, saying, okay, level one, opportunistic. So if you're just starting with your uh, secure development, uh, that's a great way to step in. If you're already a bit mature, then you can go for level two. And well, at the company I work for, uh, we do mission critical stuff, so we always basically end up with the level three. Um, the level three has around 160 security controls, all in different categories. And why I'm telling you this, because it's a big part, uh, core uh, usage in our application as well, the security knowledge framework. The idea of the security knowledge framework, the ASVS, all the knowledge base items, code examples, is basically to give insight, to don't be surprised, right? On the moment Neo was getting his potential, he saw, he didn't have to guess or he, he know where they are, he knew what to do, right? There was no best effort thing, it was like boom, he can stop them. Um, <clears throat> so I would really love to give a small demonstration about the security knowledge framework, how it would look like uh, the knowledge base sections, the code examples, and, and how you can uh, use it uh, yourself in, in the organization or for your own projects. Um, so here I have the, uh, the security knowledge framework. It is a, an online uh, uh, demo environment. We push every hour from the GitHub. There will be also uh, in the later part of the uh, <laughs> presentation a small uh, wrap up, how we do continuous integration, how do we preserve the quality we want to achieve. <coughs> um, so here we have the, uh, the login screen of the security knowledge framework. Uh, no, not yet. Here we have the, uh, yes, it's pretty big. Here we have the uh, login page. Um, so the first time you, you enter, you get this landing page and basically, we have a couple of core things you can use. So as you can see over here, we have security knowledge base items, code examples, and you can start projects. So when you go to the security knowledge base, you have like over 200 different knowledge base items that are being used or correlated against the ASVS or in the pre-development phase that gives you more <coughs> understanding of the security control you try to achieve or implement. So it gives you more in-depth context about what we're trying to achieve here as a developer. Um, <clears throat> so for example, prepared statements and binding them. Uh, what can an attacker do? What is the impact? What is the solution the, uh, the developer has to take? 
So as you can see, there are a lot of knowledge base items. So what we try to achieve here is when you need a certain specific information on the spot, you can search in the knowledge base section and get the information you need and you were looking for. Also, we uh, noticed that this is really cool, already a cool, good start, but um, we have, of course, a lot of implementation room to still introduce security issues. So for that, we also uh, created a couple of uh, uh, code examples, like 30, around 30 per language. We now support PHP and .NET. And in here, basically, <coughs> we have the, uh, uh, the secure code examples that will guide the developer through the mindset on how to approach certain type of functionality. So I have a question for you all. Who knows what cross-site scripting is? Boom, every hand up. All right, that's good. So now I want to know who is the developer of all, of all this group? Okay, who can explain, except you. You, you, you are too smart for this, so who can explain me how to prevent cross-site scripting? No, 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 you know, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so from like half of people, I only see three hands. Four, okay. Five. <laughs> Still, that is quite shocking. Um, and of course, that's why it is one of the top 10 uh, security uh, uh, risk. But still, that gives already the, how, how hard it is. I mean, cross-site scripting is, is not that hard to tackle if you know how to properly approach it. So for example, um, in this uh, security knowledge framework, we have code examples where we also have um, examples on how to properly uh, escape output. And again, why is cross-site scripting so hard? Because you need, and that is basically the uh, answer to the question I was looking for, you need to treat different or have different approaches in different contexts. So, for example, if you have a, a href uh, and you have the, uh, the possibility to inject in the URL, so where the link is placed, if you do there all the escaping, like the double quote, single quote, small n, greater than, all that dangerous characters, what do you think? Do we then still have <coughs> a, a safe, uh, have we made the user input safe? Or is it still possible to f create a cross-site scripting injection, for example? Well, the answer is yes, you can still inject a cross-site scripting injection by using the JavaScript double point and then your JavaScript code. Or even better, use the data double point and base 46 your string even to bypass even other like buffs or stuff. So it's really hard, and this is what we're trying to achieve with the code example. So really going in depth and commenting, um, yeah, on, on how to uh, approach and with wh what mindset. So here we have the different uh, uh, flavors on which context and how to escape it properly. So in here you have the URL on code with the JavaScript uh, example. So this is a great edge case that we normally uh, forget about. So. The security knowledge framework is to help developers understand the problem and give code examples that they can use to, well, create the right awareness. So those two things a developer can search and request on the spot if he needs more information about it or in depth uh, how to implement certain type of functionality. Um, then we also support the, um, uh, the creation of projects. So the idea is that you uh, start when you start building a new project, of course you will discuss with your team saying, hey, uh, we're gonna build this web application or API, which type of security requirements fits uh, our, our risk? So then you choose from level one, two or three and stick to that and use that as a security requirement. So when you start a new project and you want to uh, monitor and look at uh, the progress, you can then select it and say, okay, when, when, um, when you have a new product, you would use the pre-development phase. This is what I said before. It gives you a sort of risk threat analysis of, hey, this type of functionality will or can contain these type of attack factors. And the post-development phase is for the verification part. So when you really implement it all, you did the major release of your project, before you do the major release of your project or project, uh, you can use the post-development phase for a verification. So let me go through the, the different phases. So basically this is the pre-development phase and in here you can say, okay, for this project and for sprint number three, 
I'm going to add a user registration or user functionality. Of course, you want to specify it a bit better, but um, then the idea is that you can select uh, the add function and then you have a pull down where you can say, okay, um, I need a user registration, uh, I'm going to use some third party software, and I have to do something, I'm going to update the session state, for example. So now you can add those uh, things to, the, uh, to this specific project. And you can now say to the security knowledge framework, okay, let me, give me the feedback of all the possible things that can go wrong. As you can see, for the session uh, selection, there is no one thing you need to do. There are multiple things, and in fact, there are almost 14 things you need to think about or implement. So what will happen when you uh, miss one of those? then the whole session management implementation can be bypassed by an attacker and, well, basically can steal your account or your information or... So it's very important to have a good overview of all the things you need to do. So for sessions, it's a design pattern, similar for the user registration because, um, well, think about column transactions, you have to have a single input validation in, in your uh, library, in your project, uh, password leaking, you, all type of things you have to think about. Um, and of course, well, here we have just one knowledge base item and not a design pattern saying, hey, okay, third party software, it's all great, but think about version management. How do you detect when there's a new version or you're using an old version that possibly have CVEs and open vulnerabilities in them? So this is the, the risk analysis, the awareness to the developer, already up front before they start writing code saying, hey, please think about all this because it can lead to an attack factor. So that is the pre-development phase. Then we have uh, the other uh, phase, and that is the post-development phase. Uh, the post-development phase is, like I said, useful when you um, uh, created the, uh, did the security room requirements, did the pre-development, and then you want to go to the verification state, like saying, okay, I want to verify, did I really thought about all the security controls? And this phase of the project will help you to, <laughs> to classify this. Uh, also, I use the post-development phase for projects that are already being built, because that is a situation we also encounter a lot. So, um, in here you have a different type of che checklist, uh, as you can see. Uh, we are heavily uh, depending on the ASVS, as you can see. Uh, but we also have the possibility to add your own custom checklist. Because, yeah, maybe in your company you already have a certain type of uh, requirements and security controls. So, you can easily create your own list. So, the idea of, of this phase, of the post-development phase, is that you then, well, depending on the level of security requirements you choose to, to have, you can say, okay, let's fill it in. So, like I said, I always choose the level three, and over here you have a sort of an expert system for developers to help them, saying, okay, did you really thought about everything? So, for the people who don't know ASVS, ASVS has different type of categories. So, as you can see here, the first one is starting with the architecture, design, and threat modeling. Uh, then we have a, a super big list of uh, authentication verification requirements. So again, as you can see, that is a lot of things you have to think about. I mean, one miss, you miss one and you have a, maybe a possible huge hole open. Um, what is also important to note is there are like information uh, buttons and they give you a little bit more context uh, about what we're trying to achieve here with this security control. So the idea is that the uh, developer can uh, fill in the, the, the form and, uh, well, basically it's like an expert system, so it's a question. Verify that all the applications are known to be needed. Well, did we do that? Yes. Okay, we thought about it. Did we not do it? We leave it on no. Of course, some of the security controls are not applicable, like for example, um, uh, key storage or, you know, then you have probably uh, a central place already in your organization that you will use, so some you can say not applicable. And the idea is that you go through the whole list um, and then you can save the checklist. So this will uh, correlate every item that we selected no and will correlate one uh, them to the knowledge base items, saying, hey, you selected no on this security control, so that means we have this impact or this specific attack factor still laying there, still 
Um, so it will help the developer uh, to, to know what, what to pick up or not. So when we click on the, uh, uh, the, the button, we now can see all the, uh, yeah, the security controls and their correlating knowledge base item. So again, it will help you and give you more feedback about, okay, if you don't implement this security control, this is the possible attack factor and also the, the, the solution on how to address it as uh, a developer, how, what you should think about uh, when creating this. So, um, yeah, this is the security knowledge framework. Uh, you can spin it up locally. It is a Python Flask application, so everything is then local yeah, on, your, on your machine. Uh, we also have uh, Chef cookbooks, uh, AWS tutorials on how to uh, spin it up there. Um, yeah, and uh, that is basically the, uh, the application. Um, so, and, and, and like I said, it was all about empowering the developer, giving him or her the upfront knowledge and the free knowledge to really create awesome stuff by design securely, because that's really what we, we are missing. Um, of course, uh, we still want to do and, and have a fully uh, software development life cycle where we do also security. But as you can see, we have to do manual stuff and we have automation. Well, on the manual stuff, there is the software development life cycle, the security knowledge framework, because you still have to fill it in. But there are also code reviewing. So a good way to also use the security knowledge framework is to specify in your code, in the comment, which category it will belong to in the ASVS. Also, you want to address a different type of classification. For example, if you have a password reset or login functionality or a session function, you want to classify this as a high risk because if something goes wrong there, then it's game over, right? So those metrics and those classifications you can then use in your continuous integration uh, pipeline to flag and say, hey, if I see a code snippet being changed and I marked it high as a classification, then at least two people need to code review it, for example. So you can really use uh, awesome stuff with it. Um, well, of course, we have the static and analyzing tooling, the dynamic versions, uh, really awesome. Uh, I always also uh, like to use them, but they are more like a safety net, right? Because they take quite some time to run. There is a lot of false positives, so that's why it's also on the manual stuff. I mean, I can kick it off automated, that's not an issue, but somebody has to go through all those findings. So it's still, it can add value, but I would rather see you guys, the developers, having the context of the application, you know, empower you with the knowledge you need so you are not that dependent on, you know, SOST or DOST because they have their limitations, right? And you as a developer, you have the full context. So if you have the right security knowledge, you, you will rock. Um, so of course, we can also do some automation. Uh, we, we shouldn't do everything by hand because that's uh, insane. Um, but think about the Travis coveralls or scrutinizer. Those are things that really, like security, is part of code quality. It says something about the maturity of your product. Um, so for, uh, for the people who don't know this, uh, Travis is a continuous integration build platform where for every uh, contribution or push that's being done on your GitHub, it will pull in, does a verification, depending on what you want to test. So in our case, it will pull the latest uh, 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 request or modification from the GitHub tries to build the project, and if there's no uh, build errors or problems with it, it will continue to the next continuous integration tool, and that is coveralls. Because we also unit test all and functional testing all our yeah, functionality in the security knowledge framework, because it would be very sad if somebody adds something and it will break the application. Then we have the last part, that is scrutinizer, and that's basically doing a code quality check. So not on security, but more on duplication code, uh, dead end code, complex code. And the whole idea behind it is if we have people contributing to our project, uh, we can and they can see in like two minutes 
which phases they, they passed. So did they pass the Traverse? Project can still build? Awesome, green badge. Did they pass all the unit tests and still up to the percent it was before? Awesome, badge. And the last one, scrutinize it. That will give you the uh, rating of how good your code is. So if somebody really adds like shitty code, uh, it will immediately refer reflect in this batch saying, hey, I see, uh, yeah, the code is getting worse, so you get a lower grade. Um, I, uh, like I said, I have this also in place for the security knowledge framework project, so I really would love to uh, show you guys that. Um, also good to notice that all the tooling I, I show you now and the continuous integration tooling, you can also use for your own open source projects because the, 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 the continuous integration services, they help open source projects by uh, letting them use their services for free. So if you have open source projects, I would recommend to use that also. So now we're gonna go to the, um, the, uh, the security knowledge framework uh, GitHub. So as you can see here, we have a pull request by uh, somebody uh, who did some syntax highlighting examples uh, for us, uh, super awesome. So, what happens in the background is that Travis will see this change, will rebuild the whole uh, project with his contribution. So over here you can see he has now his own coveralls instance of his own fork of the project. Uh, he has his own uh, Travis build uh, that's uh, being uh, run. So we can here have a look. So for this one, this is uh, how Travis will uh, display uh, the information. So here we have the commit of this uh, uh, great guy. Um, here it will pull in the latest uh, checkout. It will install the, the required packages for our framework. And then it tries to build it. When the build was successful and there is no exit code, then the unit testing will be kicking in, right? And that is what we see here, unit test being kicked in. If that's okay, no error, it will push the metrics to coveralls. Um, coveralls is a really nice uh, overview of the amount of percentage. So you can see in one single moment what the impact was of this change of this uh, contributor. So if you see it dropping, then something has wrong. So you can already uh, give the feedback back to him or well, of course he sees it because it only takes like two minutes to get this feedback, right? Um, so here you have also different uh, branches uh, and different level of coverage, as you can see. So here we can track what the quality is of our project because we don't want to let it drop, right? Then the, the final check, that is the code quality check. Like I said, this, this grading system will give you in one eye, one overview, what's going on, if it's good or if it's bad. It also will tell you of all the uh, uh, added functionality and methods w which were really good and which were really bad. So for example, here we have the project checklist and the download file checklist, and they are rated critical. I know why, because they are duplicated, P big parts, chunks of that function is duplicated code that's being reused, well, in the file download file checklist and in the project file checklist. Also, these methods are really big and complex, so Scrutinizer will say, yeah, this is like ridiculous, F. So this gives us already a prioritization of which type of methods or functions we have in our project itself and which we need to improve. Because again, if it's too complex, if it's dead end code or, uh, you know, it can also lead to security vulnerabilities. Um, so basically this is how we, we maintain the quality of our project. Uh, we're going to extend it with a, a little bit more continuous integration tooling. And like I said, it's free uh, for everybody to use if you have an uh, open source project. So I would really recommend it uh, to use it. Um, so yeah, like, like I said, the idea is to make of all the developers in NEO, empower them, give them the knowledge so they can fight those hackers, those, a those agents, right? To have a fair chance against them because now we are brutally slaughtered uh, by them. And you know, I, I believe in this, that every developer can be Neo, that you don't have to dodge bullets. You can just simply stop them. Um, also, uh, we would love to get more people involved into our project. 
the more people chip in and help, that's the, you know, the better we, we can make this. And everybody, uh, yeah, should, should help. I mean, the, the current state of security is, is not as, as good as I, I would like to see it. So if you have experience in, in some of the categories or fields or you're good in, in grammar, because I'm not, or, uh, or good at certain type of uh, uh, coding languages and you know, uh, yeah, please step in. I mean, this is for the greater good, right? To help everybody out, get better and achieve the quality we want. Um, and yeah, I also want to say one more thing like, you are as strong as the weakest developer in your team. So help each other, get, give training, share your experience, you know, get involved, join OWASP or other great OWASP projects. I mean, we're really in this together. So this was the, uh, the uh, presentation I wanted to give. Um, I hope uh, it was good and if you have any questions, please, let me know. Um, hello, uh, thanks for this tool. It's, it's really great, especially uh, because of uh, open source and uh, Flask and so on. It's a great tool. Uh, my question is, uh, is there a opportunity to, to make localizations uh, of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge in this base? <laughs> Sorry, one more time. Uh, is, is there is a way to make a localization of, uh, of this information in this, in this, in this framework? I, I mean, for example, cross-site scripting. Uh, if we, in our company we want to, 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 to make our, our own localization and our own description and so on, is it possible? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Maybe I can show you a little bit how it's now structurized because that will help you uh, understand a bit more how to refactor or rebuild or like adding your own uh, knowledge base items. Let me see where my GitHub went to. GitHub. So, um, so the project itself, uh, all the knowledge base items, code examples, all that stuff, uh, is basically all in markdown format. Um, so if you add in the knowledge base sections your own markdown format and you increase the number, then it will add automatically in the security knowledge framework. So you, even people who don't know how to program Python or whatever, they can still contribute. The system will pick it up and will show it. Um, the same for the, uh, uh, the code examples. Let's see, internet's a little bit slow. But again, it's also all in markdown format, every code snippet that we're using. Um, also good to mention, we are now revamping the project again because we did it already a couple of times and we now want to move to an API base so it's also easier to get and subtract knowledge base items from the security knowledge framework through the API so you can easier integrate it into your pipeline and automation. Um, I noticed in the, um, in your demo there was a groups section, is this for, is this intended for community based uh, feedback like a Q&A stack overflow for security questions type thing or? Uh, good question, no, it's, it's more, uh, so the idea when we started this project, it was to empower developers, local machine, they have a toolkit they can use like, like, you know, picking up the right good hammer and a good screwdriver with the right head. This is the toolbox we created. Uh, but then uh, business was like, holy, this is super cool. We, we want this as a service. But then we had to, well, we have different projects and different users and they shouldn't look at each other's projects. So we had to include separation. So you can also work with multiple projects and with different users in the same security knowledge framework. So you have some segmentation. Um, so yeah, uh, but another, great uh, thing because we do um, uh, have like support uh, 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 possibilities. So this is the installation and documentation of the security knowledge framework. It's really extensive how to set it up, how to start with it, with screenshots, all that stuff. But we also have a, a support uh, tab over here that you can ask questions like, hey, I'm running into this bug, how to fix it. Normally within a couple of hours or days we respond because we're really quick and we want to make it as best as possible. 
Um, so yeah, here you can ask questions, or if you need help, then you know this is could be a place to to drop it. Um, again, the readme.io that is a, a service you normally pay for, but if you have an open source project, they give this uh, service for you to to use. So again, great thing to to use. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Oh, okay. So my question is, the checklist that you showed, is that uh, ASVS version 2 or version 3 compliant? That's a good question. So um, it is the latest, no, not the latest, because that's released yesterday. It is the 3.0 uh, version. Um, the project is now like a year old, so we started with the 2.0 version, uh, and that was thanks to uh, Jim because he said like, this is an amazing project, ASVS, D did you hear about it? And I'm like, no, looked at it and was amazed, so that's why we hooked into ASVS, and, and well, again, trying to do this together, right, uh, and, and help, help people. We released 3.0.1 yesterday, but it was just typos, so, uh, a, uh, SPF, uh, the knowledge framework's at the latest version right now. Uh, any other questions? More questions, more questions. Maybe it's uh, good to uh, tell you uh, uh, also how I uh, used it uh, in, in my daily job. So again, uh, a lot of uh, uh, in, internal developer teams using it and also our partners. So. What I normally do is let the developers go through the post-development uh, checklist, let them select all the different, uh, well, the, the, the questions. If there are coming out no, then they can put that on the backlog, implement that security control, and then when they've done all that stuff and implemented the security controls, I will go sit together with the developers, with me using the ASVS, the post-development phase, and with the code on the Beamer. And then I will go through every security control and they will go through the code and show me and, and you know, trying to, to uh, yeah, challenge them to see if they really properly implemented it. So that is basically the, the final last step I do to also help them on the implementation level to see if it's correctly been done. Uh, is there is any uh, API to integrate to, for integration with bug tracking systems? For example, uh, like Jira or something like that? No, not yet, but that's a good question. Um, would be nice to, to have it, of course. <laughs> I, I think Taras was just saying he's really eager to help the project and contribute those features. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, other questions? Basically the same question on a, on a grander scale with uh, the whole uh, development pipeline, like uh, integration into IDEA or Eclipse or Jenkins. Yeah. So um, if there's any uh, concrete plans for integrating this into the development pipeline of, uh, of most software companies where you both have a build system with Jenkins and you have your envir development environment like Eclipse or IDEA and stuff like that? Um, so now it's a bit hard to, to really uh, put it into to your pipeline because the knowledge base, I, there is no API, for example. So that's uh, something we got as a feedback. Uh, so we're now moving to API base because then you can just use it only for the knowledge base items and to get that information out of it. Or you can also, for example, run the client that's an Angular application that will talk to the API and then you still have the same application, right? So you can uh, choose then. Um, and again, indeed, some, some developer companies, software house don't have that pipeline, but still th this empowers and, and gives the developer the knowledge, right? Um, and, and the awareness that he needs to have. So moving from a best effort situation to a ver verifiable situation. Uh, so it, it can benefit from, yeah, so many different angles, basically. So what works for you best, uh, yeah. 
And if you have good experience with it, please share it so, well, we can further improve it and take it with us, so. Any more questions? As you're heading out, you'll see a, a, a green card and a red card to comment on this talk. Please put one in the basket. A warm round of applause for Glenn. Thank you, Glenn, for being here. Thank you all.